For those who don't know me, my name is Jason Oppenheim. I founded and own the Oppenheim Group real estate brokerage in Los Angeles, which is also the subject of the Netflix show Selling Sunset. The show follows me and my agents as we sell some amazing homes to the rich and famous. I love my job. I love the people I work with. I love being on the show. I really love everything about my life, but I didn't wake up to this. I want to talk a bit about that with you, some of the troubles I've had and some of the lessons I've learned about achieving success. Every day I'm asked the same question by fans of the show or aspiring real estate agents. How can they become successful and how did I do it? As though I have some trick that is going to catapult them to instant fame and success. There's so much out there floating around the internet about success and the advice you hear is often centered on the idea of speed. Get rich quick. Achieve instant success from your living room. Become a millionaire in less than a year. Invest in this company, it's the next Amazon, but better because it's using blockchain technology. In reality, and this is something I've learned throughout my life, success takes time, years of preparation and hard work. There are no shortcuts. I want to repeat that because it's important. There are no shortcuts. To be successful, you need to believe in yourself, and that means you need to do the hard work, the work to create that confidence in yourself. And I don't mean confidence in some cocky, unjustifiably loud, Wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort kind of way. It's not about exuding confidence. It's about internalizing it. In my career, I must believe in myself because as a real estate broker, I often have what is my client's most valuable asset in my hands, their home. Although I haven't always believed in myself. In fact, far from it. So I'd like to talk for a second about my past. My identical twin brother, Brett, and I were largely raised by our mom as our parents divorced when we were very young. Our mother is amazing. She worked long hours at tough jobs and tried her best to parent us. But my brother and I were incorrigible kids. We lacked respect for authority, fought incessantly with our mom, her boyfriends when she had one, and each other a lot. We were just frustrated, constantly getting into trouble at home, at school, with our teachers, even the police. Those days we spent several nights in jail, whether for underage drinking, fighting, or just adolescent belligerence. We were two kids that felt like they had nothing to lose and who didn't care much about anything. It was during those troubled years that I first learned there was no such thing as an easy fix. I realized this when my mom tried what could be described as a quick fix, or the parental version of a get-rich-quick scheme. When my brother and I were 13, she sent us to a correctional camp. She actually told us we were going to basketball camp. We packed gym clothes and were excited about the trip, only to land in Idaho and be handcuffed and taken away to the desert. Once there, the camp officer stripped us down and gave us a single set of army fatigues. That started the worst month of my life. The camp was a living hell. We hiked through the desert eight to 10 hours a day. On many days, we weren't allowed to speak. Using the bathroom required digging a hole and using cactus leaves or toilet paper. To eat, which we were only allowed to do once a day, we had to start a fire using a bow drill, and I lived on no more than three to 400 calories a day of lentil soup. For flavor, I would squeeze the butts of ants for their acidity, which tasted like lemon. I would catch and eat rattlesnakes, cutting their heads off and spending hours skinning and deboning the snake. I essentially starved for the entire month. They would take our shoes at night so we couldn't run away, not that there was anywhere to go. And there was no running water, so we didn't bathe or shower for the entire month. For one three-day stretch, I was left alone with just a large rock for shade and some water, but almost no food. This camp and others like it have been shut down, but that experience is indelibly burnt into my memory. It was in every essence rock bottom. Now, like so many success stories you hear, this is where I'm supposed to tell you that after hitting rock bottom, this was an inflection point in my life. But it wasn't. At the time, I really did think the camp had changed me, as the idea of being sent back to that place in the desert scared the absolute hell out of me the complete isolation, the deprivation, and really the worst of it, the starvation. But after this camp, I was only on good behavior for a few weeks. And as the memory of the camp faded, I went back to my old ways, and so did my brother. Eventually, we were sent off to separate boarding schools. Of course, that didn't work either. We were routinely suspended and expelled from numerous high schools and ended up going to six different high schools between the two of us. To make matters worse, I was not doing well in my classes. Not because I wasn't capable, but because I didn't care. All I cared about at the time was working on my vintage Camaro and perhaps becoming a car mechanic. For much of high school, I took occupational classes in auto body and auto tech, where I would work on my car, straightening the body, painting it, and rebuilding the engine. I barely graduated high school. This is my senior year report card. I had a 2.0 with three Ds, and of course, a few notations for poor attitude and truancy. 
but I did get an A in weight training. After my brother and I were expelled from our last high schools, I think we were about 16, the only option was a continuing education high school. My mother wouldn't let me or Brett live with her. And this is where the story changes. With nowhere to go, my father took us in. My dad is brilliant, a UC Berkeley grad with a PhD, but he also it was a two-tour Vietnam vet and very militaristic. To this day, he rides a Harley Davidson in a motorcycle gang. Now, rather than a quick fix, my dad took a different approach. He threw away all of my baggy clothes, cut my hair, took away my jewelry, took away my cigarettes, and he would wake me up at 5 a.m. to work out with him in the garage. He'd dress me for school, then drop me off for school, pick me up from school, and take me to his work, where he would have me sit in his office at the local community college where he taught. And I'd just stay there with nothing to do but my homework. Then we would go home, eat dinner, watch a little TV, and go to bed. Each and every day was like this, starting in the garage at 5 a.m. I didn't have time to hang out with friends or even one second to myself, let alone time to get into trouble. My dad was militaristic about getting me turned around. He was obsessive, extremely overbearing, and he would also whoop my ass if I wasn't acting right. Basically, he was everything that Brett and I needed. Now, things didn't change for us overnight. My dad knew that it wouldn't, but slowly the groundwork for change was taking place. I graduated high school, barely, but despite my A in weight training, I wasn't able to get into any good four-year universities. So my dad enrolled me in the local community college where he taught. At community college, my dad would talk to all my professors and ensure that I was going to classes and studying. Under his constant supervision, I had no choice but to start taking school more seriously. I began to lose my old habits. I wasn't getting into trouble as much, and I was really starting to care more about myself and my future. My dad emphasized that school was a ladder, a way, a way out of my previous troubles. So we really started taking our classes seriously. My brother and I worked hard at local restaurants, first as dishwashers, then busboys, and eventually as waiters. And we worked even harder at school. After three years at community college, we successfully transferred to UC Berkeley, where we would work even harder and we studied even more. Two years later, we graduated from Berkeley as the two top students with a 4.0 GPA. We went on to top law schools. My brother went to UCLA and I stayed at UC Berkeley. And then we were hired as attorneys at top Los Angeles law firms, Skadden Arps and O'Melveny and Myers. This process from when my dad took me in as a belligerent teenager until I graduated law school took eight years. It was arduous and it took all the energy, compassion and determination that my dad could manage and that I could manage. I studied my ass off. I worked my ass off. There was no easy fix. No 30 day camp was going to solve anything. Instead, it took eight years of constant parental guidance and hard work. Now, my story wasn't done. If it was, you wouldn't be watching Selling Sunset. You'd be watching a very boring legal show about me, as me and my legal team tackle exciting things like depositions and interrogatories. It's not that I didn't enjoy being a lawyer. It's just that there were some things that were missing. I had a pretty successful career as a litigation attorney. I spent many years working on the largest corporate fraud case this century, the Enron trial, and even went to the United States Supreme Court. After four years into my career, I was living comfortably. I was on partnership track at my firm, and I was, by every account, successful. But I felt unfulfilled. I know people who love the law and who find passion in law. Unfortunately, it just wasn't the same for me. It was a tough decision to leave. I was giving up a comfortable life, financial security, and a prestigious and stable career. But after turning my life around as a teenager through hard work and dedication, I knew I could do it again. Now that type of confidence isn't created quickly. It's not the type of confidence that's built from a quick gamble on Bitcoin or even from watching a TED talk. It's created by proving to yourself that you can dedicate by focusing years on achieving success, knowing that you have what it takes to focus your ambitions on doing the dirty work, not just checking boxes, but mastering the details, the long hours of the library or the late night after night, making sure that your work is always better than your last. That's the type of confidence I had. So I left the practice of law and sold just about everything I couldn't fit into a backpack. And I traveled the world for three years. When I came back to Los Angeles in 2010, it was the height of the recession. There were things that were pretty bleak. I was in more than $40,000 of credit card debt and I couldn't afford a car. So my family gave me my grandfather's old Lincoln, which was probably worth, worth less than $1,000. It ran, but I had to keep my trunk full of antifreeze because the car was always overheating. I equate this time in my life as a novice real estate agent 
to when I first started to focus on school at community college. But this time I was in my 30s and starting over, back at square one. I joined a great team at Coldwell Banker, but the first couple years were really tough. I sat in a tiny $24 IKEA desk in the corner of a small office I shared with two other agents. I had literally gone from the corner office at my law firm to the corner of an office at my new brokerage. I was sharing a one bedroom apartment with my friend in Hollywood, and each month we would switch between sleeping on the bed and the couch. It wasn't easy. It took me over eight months before I even closed my first deal, a far cry from where I was as a successful lawyer just a few years earlier. And as I drove that Lincoln around LA, thinking about the $100,000 Mercedes convertible I used to drive, I learned something. Here's the secret about confidence. It's not unwavering. We see a caricature of the confident man in the media, but that's a myth. There were times my ego was bruised. I even had thoughts about going back to law, but I decided to keep working harder and to continue to follow my passion for real estate. I worked 12 to 15 hours a day. I would hustle leases and small deals that others didn't want. I studied street maps. I listened to other agents on the phone and went with them to their listing appointments. I'd sit their open houses when they didn't want to. I would print out every single contract and disclosure and read them word for word, highlighting them and understanding them. I went to every team meeting and to every broker open to learn the inventory. Even though I wasn't making money, I was staying busy. I think I made less than $50,000 each of my first two years. But around my third year, things started to pick up. I was getting my own deals, small deals, but lots of them. I was getting really busy, but I made sure to do everything myself, making sure that everything was being done right with no mistakes. No detail for me was too small. I would answer every phone call. I would go to every inspection, do every showing, sit every open house and go to every broker open. I would draft every contract myself and review everything twice before sending it out. I was working so hard, I remember tears running down my face at night because I was so tired, but I had to finish things before I could sleep. And just like with my studies at school, my efforts started to pay off. By the start of my fifth year, not the fifth day, not the fifth month, but the fifth year, I finally felt like I was ready to go on my own. And that's what I did. It was 2014. I had just purchased a small house and I started the Oppenheim Group out of the second bedroom. I hired an intern fresh out of USC who still runs the office today. A year later, I saw retail space become available on Sunset Boulevard. And well, the rest is history. I hope what you can get from my story is that there is, in fact, a secret to success. After spending nights in jail, eating rattlesnakes in the desert, and leaving behind a career in law, I can say the secret is there are no shortcuts. So the next time someone comes up to me and asks me how they become successful, I'm going to say, find what you love and work your damn ass off. Thanks for watching my TED Talk.